Marvel superheroes are more popular than ever. However, it seems that most people who are fans of superheroes don't tend to read the comic books that they're based off of. Now, new comic books come out every week, and comic book publishers release solicitations for their upcoming comics every month. And in an attempt to get more superhero fans reading comic books, I come on my channel every month and talk about the upcoming comics from Marvel solicitations. So in today's video, I'm going to go over some of the Marvel solicitations for June of 2022. I'm going to go over some of the comic book news that came out this month, and I'm going to talk about a book that I read this month. And maybe I'll talk about a little DC. Just a little bit. Stars and Stripes! Hello and welcome to another Carrot Scraps video, and by another, I mean the 99th. Now, if you remember last month, I mentioned that I didn't want to be down here in the bunker for too long because I had been hearing strange noises. You see, at the time, I thought my house and the bunker were haunted, but then we found out that that was actually just the Twilight Informant. And then we also found out that there was a ghost separate from the Twilight Informant. Um... So... Because of the ghost, Carrot Slurps told me not to be in the bunker for too long, but honestly, what does he know about ghosts? You know what I mean? If I'm being honest, he, he tends to be kind of a know-it-all, and I, I just don't think he, he knows as much as he thinks he does. So I decided to face my fears and come down in the bunker and read some comics. And I discovered that this ghost isn't really that intimidating. If I'm being honest, I feel the reason why this ghost is haunting the bunker specifically is potentially because they're a comic book fan. So, you know, ghost, if you are a comic book fan, you know, feel free to sit in on this video. You know, and enjoy us talking about comic books. And before you say anything, because I know you're going to say something, I am 93.8% sure that the Twilight Informant and this ghost are, are two completely separate entities. And, and I'm 43% sure that we are haunted by a ghost and that ghosts exist. And you can't get more sure than that. Anyway, let's stop talking about ghosts and get to the Marvel solicitations for June of 2022. So first up, let's talk about the Fortnite x Marvel Zero War No. 1 crossover comic. The description of the comic goes like this. The inhabitants of the island are locked in what seems like a never-ending war, and only one thing has the potential to turn the tide, a crystallized fragment of the Zero Point that was cast into the Marvel Universe. Spider-Man and Wolverine team up with several Fortnite fighters and new recruit Shuri to hunt down the elusive Zero Shard. Will these allies be able to find it in time and avert a catastrophe? And can the heroes of the Marvel and Fortnite realities hold off the the imagined order long enough to give them a fighting chance? And who knows, you know what I mean? So this is the second crossover in the comics between Fortnite and Marvel. We've seen many crossovers in the game itself, with various skins and the entire battle pass dedicated to the crossover and the franchise. There's even been Fortnite and DC crossovers in their comics. Now I've heard some people criticize tying Marvel lore to the game, but I think it's harmless. I actually think it's less than harmless, I think it's really cool. More or less, I don't know which one it is. I totally understand why it might be silly, and that's because it definitely is, but Marvel is trying to expose fans of these characters to the comics that they might not have seen otherwise. In fact, this isn't the first time that Marvel's done a crossover like this. If you'll recall, Marvel Super Heroes Secret Wars 1984, one of the most celebrated comics of all time, and debatably the book that started event comics, had a similar crossover during its launch. Back in the day, the only reason why the Secret Wars comic was created in the first place was to tie in and add legitimacy to the Secret Wars toy line at the time, and that cross-promotion created a great number of fans who still interact with the franchise to this day. And I'm sure the same will be true of this crossover. So yeah, it's weird, but I think it's fun, and I'm excited for more people to be exposed to the world of Marvel Comics. Next up, we have the X-Men Hellfire Gala number one, and the description for the comic goes like this. At last year's gala, mutants changed the face of the solar system, terraforming Mars and claiming it for mutant kind. Do you think you can afford to miss this year's gala, all contained in this one oversized issue? And I don't know, I, I can't answer that. I honestly didn't know until this very moment that the gala was contained in just one issue. I actually might pick this up now. Now, I absolutely love the idea of having a Marvel version of the Met Gala. I think it's really cool in general to have an in-universe holiday that readers can celebrate. I also think that having a fashion show for readers to get excited about expands the audience that these books are reaching out to. And in general, I just love seeing new costumes for these characters. However, I do have a question, and it's about how often we get this gala? Now, I don't know if this is explained in the book, but if you're familiar with the sliding timescale in comics, you know that a year in our world is not a year in the comics. It's barely a month sometimes. So if this is the second annual X-Men Gala in our world, how often do they have these in theirs? Now, they might have mentioned this in the comics. I didn't read the first Hellfire Gala, and it's not really a big deal to me, but it's just something funny that I noticed. Moving on, then we have Jane Foster and the Mighty Thor number one. 
and the description goes like this. When Mjolnir comes crashing through Jane Foster's apartment window, she fears the worst has happened to Thor. As Asgard's greatest enemies, including Hela, Ulick the Troll, and the Enchantress, mount an assault on the Golden Realm, Jane must find Thor and save Asgard, even if that means she must once again risk her life to become Thor herself. I actually really like the description of that comic, and it, it makes me curious about what's going to happen next. Now, as I mentioned back in January, Marvel seems to have this trend of creating a legacy character, retiring them, and allowing the original to take their place, only to once again return that legacy character alongside the original. I don't have a problem with this. In fact, having multiple of the same hero on the same super team has been one of my favorite things since I was a kid. It's just funny how frequently this is happening right now, potentially because of the upcoming appearance of Jane Foster as Thor in the MCU, and maybe other video games, who knows? I like the idea that Mjolnir is seeking out Jane, and I'm curious what happened to Thor, if anything. Because on one of the covers of this book, it seems as if Jane has a different Mjolnir than Thor does. At least according to my memory, I feel like the new hammer that Thor made for himself in the War of the Realms comic looked a little bit different than the one that Jane is holding on the cover of this comic. And the way that it looks all fractured and torn apart reminds me of her Mjolnir that she threw into the sun. This book does have me curious about whether we'll see Jane Foster as Thor for a little bit longer. I actually thought she was getting the full return treatment, but it seems as if this is just a mini. So maybe they're testing out whether readers want this character to come back. Anyway, I think it's cool to see Jane Foster back. She never really left. In fact, she's been pretty important in storylines such as War of the Realms and her own solo title after that event, but it's nice to see her looking like Thor again. Now, I did notice something pretty interesting in this month's solicitations, and it's that a couple of different books are dealing with time travel this month. Avengers number 57, Savage Avengers number 2, Venom number 9, and maybe we can even count Spider-Man 2099. I don't know, maybe there's this much time travel and time shenanigans going on every month, but seeing so many books deal with a similar plot thread makes me wonder if they're building towards something. Like when time was broken after Age of Ultron. Do you remember that? If you don't remember that, that was just a thing that happened after the Age of Ultron comic book event, that, that time itself was broken and a bunch of other events came after that because of that event. I don't know, I thought it was pretty inter <laughs> interesting. These fools don't know the first thing about time travel. It's hilarious to see how far off they are. <sighs> what, like you know more about time travel than the people who wrote these stories? What? Yes, of course I do. What? Oh, oh yes, you're right, no, I'm sorry, that's my bad. I'm an actual time traveler from the future. What are you even talking about? Look, I'm sorry. You don't have to get all high and mighty about it. I, I said, you know, I, I didn't mean, I forgot who I was talking to for a second. Oh, yeah. Well, that makes it better. Time travel is kind of my whole deal, and you forget. Yeah, that's super nice. Thanks. I just wasn't thinking when I said that, okay? I, it, was, it wasn't like a personal attack on you. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, but do you understand how that might hurt my feelings just a little? Like, you forgot my whole deal. Look, dude. You know, it was a mistake. It's a mistake, though. Oh, let me just repair my broken heart, then. Slurps, I I understand why you're hurt. I, look, what can I do? What, like, what can I do to make it up to you? Can you buy me that cat clock I saw the other day? I bought you, like, four mounted clocks the last time we went to the thrift store. How many of those do you need? Oh, never mind. I thought you were looking for forgiveness. Oh my, oh my gosh, fine, fine, fine. We'll get in the car after this, okay? <laughs> nice. The first piece of news that I wanted to talk about today was the delay of the upcoming relaunch of Amazing Spider-Man number one, where Marvel threatens to destroy the Peter MJ marriage and John Romita Jr. returns to the book. If you're not familiar, this kind of delay is unfortunately somewhat common in the world of comics. It's understandable, but every now and again, an upcoming comic scheduled to come out in a certain month will get delayed and we all just have to be patient about that. Now I'm behind on my Amazing Spider-Man reading, so this gives me an opportunity to catch up, but I am still bummed that we aren't going to get this comic sooner. And it does make me wonder, was this delayed because of feedback from readers, or was it delayed because certain artists or writers hadn't finished their work yet? Who knows, maybe there's even a last minute change to the story, but we can't know that for sure so we'll just have to wait until this comes out. Another piece of news that I wanted to talk about was that DC Comics announced that they will be releasing a year one Riddler comic in October of this year. This is interesting to me for a couple of reasons. First of all, because that's a really long time to solicit your comic. In my opinion, generally publishers don't announce their comics this far out. I assume they wanted to capitalize off of the success of the recent Batman film, which is a common strategy in comics, to feature a character or storyline in the comics that is prominent in a movie or other piece of media at the time. And again, if you're not familiar 
with DC's Year One comics. It's an established series of comics from DC, where as the name suggests, they present a story from a character at the start of their career. We've seen Year One stories for Batman, Wonder Woman, and Superman, along with some others, and they've received mostly good reviews. So it's interesting to see the Riddler get the Year One treatment. Anyway, is that a book that sounds interesting to you? Do you think you might check it out? Let me know in the comments below. The last thing I wanted to talk about is hardly considered news, but we're going to talk about it anyway. For those of you who don't know, June is Pride Month, a month where we take time to celebrate and educate ourselves about the LGBTQ community. And generally speaking, Marvel and DC like to celebrate these months as well. Now, I'm sure we'll be talking more about Pride Month in June itself, but since the solicitations for June came out in March, we got to see a lot of new Pride comics. We saw multiple variant covers celebrating Pride, multiple books announced to coincide with the month, and a lot of social media posts about Pride itself. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, I wanted to briefly talk about my experience online when these books were announced. I saw a number of people criticizing the release of these books or asking vague questions like, this again? In addition to a number of other incoherent arguments about why these characters or this initiative shouldn't exist. And I wanted to repeat some of the things that I said online in this segment. First of all, Marvel is meant to be the world outside your window, and I can't think of a better way of making it that than featuring more characters that represent the people that exist in our world. Gay, lesbian, bi, pan, trans, non-binary, and so many other people exist in our world today, and featuring them in comics is just honesty to me. Now, some people made the case that this is not a genuine campaign, but instead a way for a company to make more money. And it's true, Marvel is making money off of the books that they're intending to celebrate Pride with. And I suppose that being disingenuous is absolutely a probable possibility. However, it doesn't make these efforts any less important to me. Yes, Marvel is self-interested, and they care about the bottom dollar and making the most money from Pride Month. However, they're also employing queer creators, and platforming characters from the LGBTQ community. And in my opinion, they're doing that better now than they've done in the past, and they're doing it better than a lot of other companies are. Whether Marvel cares about money or not, doing this gives queer creators an opportunity to make money and to share their perspective and creativity while also creating stories and characters that validate the experiences of many who are consistently undermined. What I'm saying is that even with the cons of the situation, I think the pros outweigh them several times over. In addition, while Marvel is celebrating Pride Month, they support support queer creators and characters outside of June and throughout the whole year. Now, if your point is that Marvel can do more when it comes to the LGBTQ community, I agree with you. They absolutely could and should, but I don't think that should take away from the good that's being done here. Anyway, those are my thoughts on the situation, and I suppose that was the news, uh, the news being uh, Pride is, is, is in June, and Marvel has some books for that. So uh, if you're interested, look, you know, go, go check them out. So with all of that out of the way, let's review and talk about one of the comic books that I read this month. So the comic I'll be briefly talking about today is Captain America and Iron Man number four. And I chose this comic because it has the Captain Hydra armor on the cover. And it's been a while since I've heard about Secret Empire, so I wanted to, to see what they had to say about it. Now at the start of the comic, Steve Rogers and Tony Stark find themselves in a bit of a sticky situation. They're trapped on a repurposed helicarrier that for all intents and purposes is commanding and leading an army of robots to bring about an age of new technology that sunsets humanity. The rogue AI that's in charge of this helicarrier and this revolution is called the the Overseer. Steve Rogers begrudgingly wears the Captain Hydra armor to trick the sensors on the ship and allow Tony Stark and the wounded casualties to escape. Steve stays behind on the ship because the helicarrier can change positions and cloak to never be found again. And as predicted, as Iron Man leaves, the ship does cloak and disappear, making it near impossible for anybody off the ship to discover it again. Now, the Overseer is an artificial intelligence created to make people's lives better. It was repurposed by one of Tony Stark's latest romantic partners and is now going rogue. The AI was developed during the time of Secret Empire, and so that's why the image of Captain Hydra doesn't cause them to attack. But as Steve fights these robotic enemies, the AI will eventually get wise to their trick. Elsewhere, Tony Stark confronts a senator who was cooperating with Veronica Eden, who was trying to use the rogue AI to bring about the end of superheroes and lead Hydra into the future. And this senator and Veronica were essentially trying to create a situation where they both controlled S.H.I.E.L.D. and Hydra, so that way they had a greater level of control over future conflicts. Back on the ship, Steve helps Veronica escape her robotic captivity in an attempt to stop the Overseer. As the issue continues, Steve gains information from Veronica as they fight robots. At the same time, Tony is getting similar information from the Senator. In the final moments of the issue, a team of superheroes called the Paladins are revealed to be less than virtuous when they kill the hero that Tony Stark was trying to rescue. And it appears as if this group will be the true enemy that Tony and Steve have to fight in the end. 
So I'm going to be honest, this was a difficult read for me since I didn't read the first couple of issues. I actually wanted to read the first three issues before I read issue number four, but I just didn't have the money for it this month. Even though I read the exposition page that explained what happened in the previous issues, and even though a lot of the issue has characters expositioning the details of what came prior, there were just so many characters and plot points to keep track of that it was hard for me to get all of that straight without reading the other issues myself. However, I did still like a number of things about the comic. I thought it did a great job at portraying the action, and I had a great time watching Steve Rogers kill robots, as well as making the dialogue-heavy scene with Tony Stark and the Senator engaging as well. I mean, many comics render superheroes fighting robots, and I think this comic did a better job than many others. Speaking of robots, I really liked the design of these robots. I thought they were very old-school comics in a lost-in-space kind of way. I always appreciate goofy-looking robots that are treated like a legitimate threat. I also loved seeing the Captain Hydra armor back, and I thought they worked the armor into the story in a clever way. Now, I'm not sure if this was intentional, but something else I liked is that Tony Stark narrated the issue, and it felt as if his thoughts on superheroes and how dangerous they can be reflected his ideology in the original Civil War. By that I mean the comic and, and not, you know, the historical event. I don't necessarily feel like Tony always resembles that version of himself, so it was nice to see what I felt like was a subtle nod to that way of thinking. Now again, I didn't read the other issues, but I would have liked to have seen more of the main antagonist, the Overseer, in this comic. Or maybe a little more from the Paladins, since they were the big twist at the end. It just felt like there was a lot of discussion about the bad guys, who weren't visible for much of the story. Lastly, I do think that the general motivation of the antagonists is a little too simple for my liking. Villains wanting to eradicate the vague notion of superpowers and superheroes because they're the real threat is at this point an all too common motivation, and I'm just not as impressed by it anymore. Honestly, I'm way more interested in the accidental Terminator robot uprising instead of the thing that they were trying to do in the first place. In the end, I enjoyed this comic, and if I can say one positive thing about it, it did make me want to read the other issues. It doesn't seem groundbreaking, but it has good art with excellently rendered action, and I like to see Tony and Steve on a mission together throwing banter back and forth. So for overall quality, I give this book a 14 out of 20, and for accessibility to new readers, I give this book a 5 out of 20. It's not impossible to understand, but it's definitely not simple. Keep in mind, you have to be aware of Captain America and Tony Stark's recent history, the events of Secret Empire, and then the events of this comic specifically. So picking out one issue from a series of five, it's going to be a little difficult for you. And those are my thoughts on Captain America and Iron Man number four. So in the end, is my new house haunted? Honestly? Who cares? Even if the bunker is haunted, we've learned today that that's not gonna stop me from marching downstairs and reading a stack of comic books. And if you're still listening, Ghost, and you are a comic book fan, you know, feel free to read any of my comics. You know, I got a big library to choose from. Although, be, be gentle with my books, you know what I mean? None of that thumb on the spine silliness that damages the book. And, and, and put it back in the bag and board when you're done with it. Even if you're taking like a short break, just put it back in the bag and board take care of my comic books. I mean, being undead is no excuse for, for ruining a collection. You understand me? You listening? I live a strange life. Anyway, that's gonna do it for this video. If for some reason you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a like and to subscribe to my channel for more. As regular viewers know, I make a variety of content on my channel and I'm always gonna make the videos that I wanna make. But if you see something you enjoy, make sure to let me know and I'll try to prioritize that kind of content in the future. Also, I forgot to mention this last month, but I guest starred on the Superhero Game Show on Synchro Champs YouTube channel. This was a legally distinct family feud where we got to play superhero trivia and I got to enter a battle of the minds with my rival, Suki is okay. Who won this superhero trivia? You'll have to watch the video to find out. So check out Synchro Champs channel, and while you're at it, check out Suki is OK's channel. I had a lot of fun being on the show, and I'm sure a lot of you would really enjoy it. Anyway, if you want to watch me play video games live, check me out on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Carrot Scraps, and all my other social media, Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram, are at Carrot Scraps as well. So I want to thank you again so much for watching, and I'll see you soon. So first, let's talk about the Marvel Fortnite crossover comic. So first up, let's talk about Fart Fartnite. Oh no, <laughs> didn't mean that one. So first up, let's. <clears throat> so first up, let's talk about Fartnite. Wow, I can't not say Fartnite. That's insane.